My name is Katerina Stojkova Klemer and I'm the founder and senior editor of Accents Publishing. This is a reading in which participants of the writing challenge will share new poems which they have written during the month of June. The writing challenge was an idea spearheaded by the Morris, Morris Bookshop and Accents Publishing. Hap and I were at Holler Poet Series and we were waiting in line to hug uh, Eric Sutherland and we started talking about uh, writing every day when we're forced to and doing that a whole lot better than uh, when um, we're left on our own and we thought wouldn't it be so wonderful if people in Lexington write together and uh, here we are now writing together. So we wanted to have a month when many of the creative people in our wonderful town write together are inspired together and jointly contribute to the creative life of Lexington. Over 80 people um, have been writing and sending their work on a daily basis to the Accents Publishing blog. Check it out, it's fantastic and truly inspirational in its diversity and harmony. The purpose of this event is to showcase some of this new work. And, um, Hap Hulihan, store manager of the Morris Bookshop, will uh, co-MC with me, and we will introduce each reader, and each will read uh, one or two poems. And um, now I will introduce the first reader for tonight, which is Christopher Miller. Christopher Miller is a Yankee who migrated to Lexington area in 2004, an avid reader of poetry, he began writing his own verse in early 2012. He is a practicing Buddhist who enjoys reading, meditation, playing guitar, and watching the birds at his feeders. Please help me welcome Chris Miller. Good evening. Batting lead off. I've got two this evening, and the first one is called Field Guide Entry. Sometimes reclusive, often observed alone in public, gets along well with others of his species, known to attack own reflection. Occasionally misidentified with other males, look for marking above right eye, cabinet corner, and a long left forearm, lost argument. Size may vary depending on time of year and relationship status. Identifying behaviors include bird watching, indulging passion for baseball and hockey, devotion to Slayer and Iron Maiden. Diet consists of beer, bread, and cheese, supplemented with bourbon in winter months when necessary. Plumage and manner of speech can lead to mistaken judgment of orientation. Observe mating habits before making determination. Currently not on endangered species list, but low numbers stoke concerns of extinction. And this is called Until Next Time. Just as a copious amount of heady libations inebriates my mind, passion's intensity by volume intoxicates my heart. The mind clouds, loses all contact with notion of sanity. Soul abdicates control, surrenders to love's rapture. I imbibe in ecstatic states until consumption ceases, when elation and joy are replaced by the ache of revocation. Clarity arrives when I awake the morning after with the conviction that I will never do that again. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And now it's my great joy to introduce Hap Hulihan, um, who has been uh, the co-mastermind of Lexington Poetry Month Writing Challenge. And he is the manager of the Morris Bookshop. He has been a regular reader at the Holler Poet series since 2010 and was a featured Holler Poet in June 2012. He lives in Lexington with his family. Please help me welcome Hap.
Thank you all very much. I just wanted to thank everyone, now that I have so many of you in the room, for sharing in this. I think it's just been wonderful. And the thing I like about it most, maybe, is it really didn't take that much work. <laughs> it just said, hey, who wants to do this? And everybody said, I do. And that's what it's become. I, I hope in, in future years it'll only get bigger and bigger. And again, thanks for, to everyone who's participating. It's going very well. All right, I've got a poem for you, and then I will bring on our next person. Uh, this is called Merkin Pie. Always hear tell of those bad, good old days from sad, beat old men. They all moan the same thing. You could just leave pie to cool on the sill with little to fear from passing hobos, bad passing hobos. But I've read my history. They did steal the pies, not every last pie, but they stole all the same. Now. We know better. Each home with a pie safe. Top people have vaults, each holding some thousands. Rumors run round. Some have pie buildings, secret locations with armed guards and traps. More pies than a man could ever slop down, completely secure. So these are the good days. The hobos don't learn. It's, it's comically sad. So used to taking, they can't break the habit. They hatch their vague plots and die by the thousand, or carried away to work in the bakeries. My granddad told me that hobos, hobos were rare back when we were fools just leaving our pies out. But he's got it wrong. His mind must be fading, because we got hobos outside every door now. Thank you. Uh, next person up is Karen George. Karen who wrote Into the Heartland from Finishing Line uh, in 2011, has received grants from the Kentucky Foundation for Women and the Kentucky Arts Council. Her work has appeared in, or is forthcoming in Louisville Review, Memoir, Border Crossing, Permafrost, Still, Kudzu, and the Heartland Review. She's got, uh, if you wanna read the poetry she reviews, it's at uh, readwritepoetry.blogspot.com. Dot com. Please welcome Karen George. I've got two poems that aren't too long. The first one's called Animal Abodes. Last night I watched nature. Homes animals build with the only tools their own bodies. The swift, slick saliva on cave walls to form nests for a single egg, only to have it snatched for egg drop soup. With its teeth, the beaver bores into a trunk until it leans, lets the wind and trees wait bring it down. The prairie dog digs a tunnel, distinct rooms to birth, eat, sleep, and an owl becomes a squatter in one of the chambers. There is so much beauty to learn. The older I get, the less I know. And this poem is called, My Former Life. In spring, I drive past our house of 18 years, where I stayed five more after you died. I linger near the hill garden where I slid and broke bones. Clumps of purple sage meet black-eyed Susans. Stargazer lilies rise from beds of ajuga and snow in summer. I lean to see the backyard where a Newport plum once splayed almond-scented blooms. Couldn't catch my breath when I first saw the new owner had lopped it down. Why do I always return to places of longing and loss? Thanks. Thank you, Karen. And um, next reader is Bernie DeVille. He teaches humanities at the Montessori Middle School of Kentucky after a 13-year career in book selling. 
a lifelong poet, his latest collection, Many Directions, is available at the Morris Bookshop. He lives in Lexington with his wife, Barbara, and his son, Julian. Please help me welcome Bernie DeVille. Big people. You all are much less intimidating than the middle schoolers I usually deal with. <laughs> I don't write long poems, so I have two here tonight. The first is excavating. I am the eldritch resurrectionist of lost things, a dream archaeologist, a slovenly backpacker of the imagination, creating a catechism of the miscellany of youth from the rusted toothy bottle caps pulled from the earth of my memory. Come tour the little time tomb, an atrocity exhibition of one who knows the gnawing gravel of fear in the stomach, the butterfly collector, the bone shaker of the extinction machine. Unrolled, the map I'm making is thematic, not linear. In the blank places, though, there still be monsters. Humans, the comic book. Stop discriminating amongst your perceptions and it might be discovered that those insidious ideologies that creep at the edge of your understanding like little scuttling arthropods just might have the buzz that you need outside of the God, devil, church, state, black, white, us, them dualities that bind us to the maladjusted practice of self penalization that pitifully aggrieved inner child needs to drink unchecked from the furious fire hose of information before getting bounced off the cliff of uncertainty to see what superpower it has. Because we all have one. Some form of tremendous magic buried in the biology that we let our culture codify. Kiss a fire breather. Hug a diamond soul. Join the Doom Patrol. I have every super skill that you have never thought of, and I use them every day. You may remember our hearing about our next reader about uh, 47 seconds ago in uh, Bernie's introduction. Um, Julian DeVille is 18 years old and studies creative writing at SCAPA at Lafayette High School. He enjoys, I can't say that, just kidding. He enjoys DJing, biking, and programming computers. And you just graduated SCAPA, did you not? Yeah. All right, we've just updated his bio. Um, and he's heading to EKU where his mom teaches and that's not gonna get in the way of the things in the least, right? Okay, please welcome Julian DeVille. All right, um, speaking of not being able to say that, um, I am now down to one poem I'm allowed to read. <laughs> um, okay, um, this is called How to Write. Breathe until you feel the nitrogen atmosphere raining its gravitational pull on your shoulders. Get obsessed with something. Let life's doctors pour allergen testing modules into your brain's fleshy meadows until it itches. Scratch it, scratch it, cut it, skin it until the idea is flamed, then pick the scab and let it bleed on paper. Write imagery on purpose, write meaning on accident. Thank you, Julian. Next reader is Robin Lamer Rahia. She is the poetry editor at Rabbit Catastrophe Press, and she serves as an intern at Accents Publishing. Please help me welcome Robin. Hi. If your name didn't make it on the list for tonight, that was my fault. That was my job for Accents, so sorry. Um, this poem is from the point of view of the rat that 
the Iranian government sent into space. That actually happened. So this is a, it's called a rat spooks himself by feeling empathy for the first time. To lack the land on which to spill my shadow grows this thing inside me, this thing that is an absence of a thing. To think my meat and skin could be filled so, or perhaps emptied so. I did not know my capacity for absence, found through this want to be vessel for these lovers, these creatures of common flight, whose language I barely hear, to comb their shadows into my fur, to carry their shadows into the sun. This thing inside me grows, this thing that is sacrifice. Thanks. Next we have Jason McKinley, McKinley Williams. Jason is a software developer, erstwhile high school English teacher, erstwhile writer, erstwhile whatever else interested him at the time. His work has been published in Appalachian Heritage, Kudzu, Public Republic, and a few other places. Please welcome Jason McKinley Williams. Thank you. I'll have a couple of short pieces. This first one's called Being Our Own Nemesis. It's a reference to the Greek goddess of retribution who most famously cursed Narcissus to stare at his image uh, as punishment for his vanity until he died. And our culture is often called narcissistic. And I wrote this because I think that comparison is unfair uh, to Narcissus because we are far, <laughs> far worse uh, than he ever thought about being. So, um, Narcissus, you lacked ambition vainly tracing the lines of your shimmering face. Kephas has surely taught his boy water's fallibility. Mere rainfall could sever your gaze, ringlets swelling, gliding across the glassy pool, concentric collisions marring that flawless face. Only a breeze, hissing through the forest fallen leaves, warping your reflection. Worse still, the ripples nudging you awake, flooding your pristine ears with wretched birdsong and the wind-borne mutterings of lesser men. What we could teach you, Narcissus, we've outstripped you with faultless, immortal faces, frozen in zeros and ones, not merely captured, sharpened, filtered, retouched. You rank amateur. You never felt the ecstasy of shedding all periphery, all your senses conspiring, rejecting even a thought that's not your own of squeezing into a snug, silent room with one dim glow, no hunger, no unsated thirst, watching only your face, hearing only your thoughts, spoken in only your words, echoed from your splendid voice to your perfect, entranced ears. And this next one is called, How a Teacher Prepares for an Open House. <laughs> Move the swastika desk to the back of the room. I always somehow have three or four and no school funds to repair them. And while you're at it, clean up all the scribbled artwork, not just the upside-down numerals, the crowns, and other gang cryptography you get to wipe up every day, but every Jessica loves Dustin forever and Slayer, and even that dragon sketch that shows real talent suitable for framing, title, irritable dragon, artist, anonymous student in second row, medium, number two pencil on desktop. Scan the annotated papers on the bulletin board so you'll remember what examples you have close at hand. Project your class blog onto the screen. Pull up your class Facebook page on your phone. It's blocked by the school filter. Lay out a stack of index cards with phone, email, and URLs. Review every F and D grade carefully, praying their parents will attend. Review every 89B exhaustively, knowing their parents will attend. <laughs> Sit out four chairs in the hallway in case there's a line. Sadly, there never is. Open your door, grateful for every student dragged or dragging. Bite your tongue when the father says, yeah, I hated all them essays in English class too. Don't forget, what you do tonight is also teaching. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. And now, Rudy Thomas. Rudy Thomas is the editor and publisher of Old Seventy Creek Press. 
He has published 24 books of his own, mostly poetry, but three novels and a book of short stories. He has published more than 800 poems, articles, and or short stories in magazines and journals. He says, I am ancient enough to have won the Jesse Stewart Award for poetry when he was still alive. Please help me welcome Rudy Thomas. How many of you this week uh, heard about the FBI digging for Jimmy Hoffa's bones? <laughs> that kicked off the poem I'm going to read tonight. And I should have titled the poem, Dead Kentucky Poets. And I'm going to mention Harriet. Does anyone know who, who Harriet is? A couple, Harriet Simpson, Arnold. I'm going to mention Jim Wayne. Anyone familiar with Jim Wayne? Jim Wayne Miller. And I'm going to mention James Steele. And I'm going to mention Jesse Stewart. And I'm going to mention Hollis, who uh, gave, gave me uh, the th thought for this poem this week. Hollis Summers, who once taught English at UK and went to Ohio to teach. Uh, each of these poets uh, or authors, Kentucky authors, really contributed to my learning to write. So this is a poem dedicated to dead Kentucky poets. Harriet, the words you sowed on the Cumberland yet grow, but old Burnside lies buried beneath Lake Cumberland. Your voice is still alive in my mind, as clear as when you spoke. I never go into the bedroom with my characters. I admire them too much to spy on them. Jim Wayne, how much I owe to you, no man nor woman can ever know who did not have you as their mentor. Does anyone here know what a pack saddle is, you ask that first day in Appalachian literature? I was the only one to raise my hand. You took it and led me from there to values and beliefs I did not know I had. James. Your river led me to discover Old Seventy Creek. The squirrels your hunter shot were the squirrels I learned to stalk. Your two boys walking through the stony dark to get an education, and your listening to old men at stockyards and turning their words into stories taught me to listen to the man on the courthouse square who whittled cedar bird. I dedicated a, a poem to that Whitler. Jesse, the day in London, England, when you got up from your seat and took the microphone from the driver to introduce yourself as a Kentucky writer and a student of the world, made me understand that every writer must be his own or her own salesperson. Fifty votes before breakfast helped me to know why my father worked the polls, and the two of us celebrated the year of your rebirth. Hollis, you simply, you simply taught me to start from home and not waste time digging for Jimmy Hoffa's bones. Thank you. Melva Sue Pretty, a native Kentuckian, in case her name didn't tip you off, um, lives now lives near Lexington, Kentucky, with her husband, Gene Strode. Together, they share five children and 11 grandchildren. Melva Sue attended Berea College and the University of Kentucky before completing an MFA in writing from Spalding University's um, 
low residency writing program. Excuse my bad eyesight. She has had a long relationship with Heinemann Settlement School's Appalachian Writers Workshop. Please welcome Melva Sue Pretty. I appreciate this, uh, this chance to read poetry with all of you Lexingtonians. Um, and I, I appreciate um, Katerina and Hap putting this together. Um, this first poem is called, Go Where My Body Says Go. My most recent mantra, do what my body says do. Go where my body says go. After years of listening to other bodies, I'm finally listening to mine first. If my body says yes, it means yes. If my body says dig in the earth, rooting out wild violets and crabgrass from the strawberries until I say enough, I obey. If my body says drink cold water, I drink cold water. If my body says watch sound of music, I watch sound of music. I tolerate bad behavior less and less and find more and more of my body to trust. Motion and sweat and music are the mirrors my body leans into, my body trust mirrors trust. This poem is called Mindfulness. Um, I was trying to write this poem and my body kept saying, get up and go do this, get up and go do that. So <laughs> this is what came out, mindfulness. There will be no all in this poem, no every, no never, no forever. This poem will only cover now and here and this minute portion of dust on my fingertips. A cardinal vine that curls a tobacco stick this side of the garden now trying to reach the sundial here. The two inch sprouts of pokeweed dotting the soil around the cardinal vine the tender heat left on my fingers after slipping their roots free. A tightening in my stomach as I stretch to reach a few more sprouts unwanted in this spot. Here, in the sky to the east, clouds rolling in, rain scenting the now world. Thank you. Thank you, Melva. Zachary Johnson. After class once, the teacher called him Thunder River. She handed him a folded paper and told him, that's your poet name. You can keep it a secret if you want, or you can tell the world. And what do you think? What do you think he decided? Please help me welcome Zach. Okay, I'll do two short ones. This one's called Something Flickered. Something flickered, then burned out inside me last night between Sidebar and Short Street. Something related to perfect weather. <clears throat> After 3 a.m., bicycling home from the tattooed paralegal's studio apartment, sex and conversation both were good, but incurred a hazy need within to be alone. She said, you know, it's rude to leave after. Before going, I apologized under false pretension of an idiosyncratic yearning for my own bed. This one is called We Are the Green Nudes. Uh, it's about, a, you know, in Gratz Park at the Third Street end, there's that statue, so. And it's for uh, my friend Janae. We are the green nudes in Gratz Park. I am holding a sailboat, smiling at your perky breasts. You perch, serenely enthralled, swatting the fifth third bank away from the Carnegie Center into cumulus clouds, all shrouded in ash leaves. Here in Gratz Park, without regrets, 
I would have loved you, frozen within this fountain dedicated to youth forever. We as ice, old copper. Our image, a gift to the children of Lexington. Our offering, arrows over broken water pipes that surge like tapering piss streams while pursed-lipped fogies traipse around and admire us, trapped in endless adolescence. Time to introduce our co-host, Katarina Stoikova Klemmer. Katarina is the author of three poetry books, most recently The Porcupine of Mind from Broadstone in 2012. Her first poetry book, the bilingual The Air Around the Butterfly from Fakel Express 2009, won the 2010, am I gonna pronounce this right? Penchos? Penchos Oak Award given annually to recognize literary contribution to contemporary Bulgarian culture, where she hails from, and we're proud to call her a Lexingtonian now, Katarina Stoikova Klemmer. Thank you, Hap. And um, I have a couple of poems, too. As above, so below. Rain, drums, over the dome of the sweat lodge. Man drums inside. The stones glow, incandesce, the bodies drizzle. The earth turns moonwise. And the second poem is called S U C C O R. I'm not sure if I'll pronounce that right. Sucker, sucker. Okay. And it came from a prompt by Nikki Finney. It has an epigraph. The little house was built of bread and covered with cakes, but the windows were of clear sugar. That's from Hansel and Gretel by Brothers Grimm. Before each discovered the other had blood and teeth, we kissed to the best of our abilities from both sides of the pain, brimmed with the sweet, clear world in between, which slowed down, thinned into hairlines, shards, debris, until one of us moved in, the other checked out, though neither was free to leave. The haunted forest, the magic, the threat of being eaten alive and well. Thank you. And next uh, reader is Matthew Houghton. Matthew Houghton is the author of Stand in the Stillness of Woods that was published by World Tech Editions. His chapbook, Be Coursing Box, that came out of Accents Publishing, was nominated for the Weatherford Award for Appalachian Poetry Book of the Year. His poems have appeared in several journals, including the Louisville Review, Still, Border Crossing and the Four Way Review. Houghton works as a public school teacher in Frankfort, Kentucky. Please help me welcome Matthew Houghton. Right. <clears throat> How's it going? I'm a doodler, I draw all the time, and so it's not unusual that if I was looking for something to write about in my notebook, it'd probably be a little drawing of something. So here is a poem I wrote yesterday called Sketching. How do you sketch a windfall? Be it time of falling or gathering. Reach out, touch the skin of an apple. Study it for every sensation. Take note of how the surface turns from russet into gold, no matter if it's shiny or dull. Remember the seeds buried within, how it clung for a moment before dropping as one 
wholly perfect apparatus, and with a stub of charcoal, fill the page just as casually, as if breathing onto it or stroking the spiked skin evenly. Thanks. I love that one, Matthew. We've got Christine Nowak up next. Christine is originally from Washington State, but moved to Lexington about five years ago. She's been writing poetry on and off for most of her life, but is currently trying to make it a more integral part of each day. I guess we all have been. Uh, and by the way, there is no reason to stop writing at the end of June. Just gonna remind you of that. Everyone, welcome Christine Nowak, please. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm gonna be reading two poems tonight. The first one is called The Meeting Room, Shaker Village. If sound echoes, then it must echo forever. Softer with each iteration, the more delicate the ear needed to catch it. In every place where there was singing and dancing and stomping, there must be some faint reverberation that gets closer to silence, but never reaches it. The room where they sang is all clean benches now, a great stage of empty and gleaming floor, windows that cast rivers of sun across the barren wood. I could swear there is nothing here, not even ghosts. But somewhere under this veneer of silence, there must be dozens of voices pounding into song. There must be heavy footfalls that shake these same windows. There must be more than these lone lines of light and shadow tracking time across the floor. And the second poem I'm gonna read is called The Mockingbird Sings a Car Alarm. <laughs> the Mockingbird sings a car alarm and makes it sound almost beautiful. In the drowsy heat above a parking lot, the bird is pouring out that same pulsing of noise that woke everyone last night, that brought a few to their balconies, their eyebrows low and their mouths curled down as if they could stare the car into silence. Most of us have turned that sound into tight exhalations or dark circles under our eyes by now. The mockingbird has turned it into music, as if it were nothing as if it hadn't even noticed the difference between everyday sound and song. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christy. Next reader is Elaine Moore-Turin. Uh, she was born in Appalachia to teach her parents who loved poetry, taught at UK College at Bahamas, uh, Fayette County School, UK graduate, and uh, she served on UN World Bank Committee for Technology Assistance in Education to the Bahamas. Publications include Vogue, um, Vogue Prix, Prix de Paris. Vogue Prix de Paris, uh, Napa Review, uh, the literature, Southern Florida, and others. Please help me welcome Elaine Moore Turain. Thank you, Katharina, for that intro. I think she is God's blessing to the bluegrass. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, two poems I'd like to share with you tonight. Um, one is called, One with God is a Majority. My mantra is truly, succinctly expressed, One with God is a Majority. That's the title of Saul Bloom's book I read many, many years ago. I don't remember the text. And he was a Jewish philosopher I did not know. But that title... I surely know. When hurts or disappointments have pierced me through, I say that title that rings so true, 
one with God is a majority. Life is forever. Our bodies just an earth life dress to clothe our spirit souls. Later, we live on another plane, or perhaps to return to earth again, if God deems it so. God is in control. So living his way, loving, being kind, and truthful too, will bless and honor you. One with God is a majority. And the other poem I'd like to share with you is called Born to Write. Born to Write. I write, awake, asleep, not knowing what I do, inevitably, inevitably, I am me, at times not knowing myself, what I wrote or when, and yet I hide inside myself, denying what I was born to do. My children grown, and grandchildren mostly on their own. I live unfettered by no one but myself, and yet I wear the chains I would throw off, disconnect, be free, me, raw, soul physicality known to all in God as his child and yours, for we are one. So let it be. Let me come to visibility now and forever, one with all and the all. My God, universality accepted and accepting. this name doesn't ring a bell, you have not been paying attention. Bronson O'Quinn lives in Lexington, Kentucky, where he writes and participates in the local literary scene. He published a satirical stay. It's not going to stay. All right. He published a satirical novella in 2012 and operates his own blog called DisposableTea.com, as well as, and this is where you know him from, the Accents Publishing blog. He likes local music, craft beer, and inspired conversation. I just want to thank him, as I think all of you should, for doing all the scut work uh, this month. He has put every single poem that any of you sent straight out on the web for everyone else to see, and he makes no big deal out of it. But, but it is a big deal, and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Bronson. Where are you? Come on up. Thanks, guys. Um, appreciate it. I also want to say thank you, everyone, for your kind words. Um, absolutely makes it worth it. Uh, so I wrote this poem this morning. It hasn't made it to the blog for some reason. But um, <laughs> if I could, I'd like some um, audience participation. So um, snap, clap, or tap, because um, I need a beat. I need a beat, a guide, a marker, a meet. I don't need a path to follow, but I want it for when I stray. The destination stationary, I will find my way. Just don't tell me how to march, push forward, or retreat, because I just need a beat. The rhyme, the meter, the feet. I can write a poem well, but I'd rather write it wrong. Just because I know the rules doesn't mean I'll play along. Because I don't need to win, so I'll never admit defeat. I just need a beat. The pulse, the passion, the heat. I do what I do for me. Of this, you can be certain. And I will hold the spotlight until they pull the curtain. I appreciate the applause and praise, but you can take your seat. Because I just need the beat. Thank you. Now I will introduce Kerry Birchfield. Kerry grew up in extreme 
southeastern Kentucky and has lived in Kentucky most of her life. She moved to Lexington area in 2002 to study English at UK. After some time out in the real world, she came back to the academic life and currently works at UK. Please help me welcome Carrie Birchfield. Thank you. There we go. I have uh, two poems for you all tonight. Uh, the first one is the very first one that I wrote for this challenge, and it came about as I was driving down the highway. I happened upon this scene. So the first part is the point of view of the other person, and the second part is the point of view of myself. And it's called Friday on the BG. My trucks broke down on side of BG. Buddy gets this bright idea, take a jaunt across the way to the middle. Two trucks are parked in the shoulder of the BG, one with its hood up. Two guys are crouched down in the median, one with his hat off, scraping up a puddle. And this next one is called A Yellow Jacket's Wanderings. Petals of paper, cream and lilac, facets of wings, iridescent and mourning. Stinger punctures air. Traverse the page. Plants of plastic, copper and aluminum. Antennae pivot slowly. Meander along edges, tasting every step. Thank you. Tyler Worthington was born in a, in a Central Baptist Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky, Fayette County. He grew up with ties to an extended family in Frankfurt and Versailles, as well as Blacksburg, Blacksburg, Virginia, and the county of Cuba in Upper North in Upper New York State. He grew up attending school in Lexington, and he is currently still doing so at the University of Kentucky as he is pursuing a major in anthropology. Please welcome Tyler Worthington. Thanks everybody, it's great to be here. Um, I have one poem to read today, it's a little bit long. And this is called, What Beats the World? Um, interesting how it came up. Uh, this old uh, blue collar man once asked me this question, I had no idea how to answer him. So later on that night, I answered him. What beats the world these days? 1245, it's the next day, but not yet. The stars look so far from far away and the piercing tones of the train going through what used to be a small town, but is now a small city, sounds so perfect from where I sit. But here it couldn't happen any other way. Nearby, small stars light the streets that seem so lonely and tired at the end of the day. And the faces of the old houses, built long ago, for the mutual benefit of small guests from all over small cities and small capitals and small kingdoms, prefer to look towards the empty streets and the busy streets, not really in the same boat, so I wouldn't say indifferent, just not meant for that. And while a few small guests are still awake, many are sleeping, or eating, smoking, drinking, inhaling, exhaling, snorting, swallowing, tossing and turning, writing, reading, talking and snoring. I guess nothing sleeps, except the houses facing the streets. Not even the country can say it gets a good night's rest, for there are even a few yet awake there, their vehicles are driven by small guests around dips and turns on old country roads where smaller guests alight and make their daring and regular scuttling of faith across a small paved or gravel road. And all the while the vehicles are driven by small guests as they listen to sounds glorious and welcoming from their sound emanating machines, late night world news reports, music in every form, yet recognized and popularized by other small guests. Oh, there's so much more to come. What fun, oh what joy, to live in a waking dream, but never really sleeping, in a world that houses all of us small guests and never sleeps, as it faces the stars so far and near away in the silent understanding streets.
Thank you, Tyler. And now, Saad M. Al Obaidi. He is 20, he attends uh, Berea College and studies philosophy. He enjoys scholarly readings, um, the humanities, because it stimulates and refines both his intelligence and ethics. He tries not to pontificate in public, but sometimes he cannot resist. <laughs> his favorite token of poetry is short, but powerfully and well-expressed poetry. Please help me welcome Saad. The title of this poem is Justine, or The Misfortunes of Virtue. Love charges 15 for a dream. When morning comes, her dry eyes open like a plastic purse. She slips love her last 20 and waits for change. Thank you. Debbie Cooper grew up in deep southeastern Kentucky in western West Virginia. She published her first poem in the Huntington High School newspaper when she was 16. She lives in Cynthiana where she enjoys writing, gardening, and playing with her granddaughter, Hazel. Please come on up, Debbie Cooper. Thank you. My first poem is Jim, and that's spelled G-Y-M, and it's for Ty. Lying on the mat, I see the blue letters O-O-D out the window, next to the tip of what could be a running shoe or naked toes. As I do the deep breathing, he is telling me to concentrate deep breathing, deep into my belly, full exhale through my nose. I notice the many colored balls in the corner, the black free weights lined neatly on their racks, the hanging handled stretchy ropes I hate to use. I should be emptying my mind, but I fill it up with images. Oh, there's a bad word, I forgot. Good year, good year, no way. <laughs> I tell him I am here because when my mother died two years ago, I sat down. I sat for two years. I could hardly move after all that sitting. That's why I am here. I need to learn to move again. I need to learn to breathe again. The session finished, I walk out into a vibrant June blue day. I look up at the sign with the winged sandal of Hermes, the god of transitions who traveled with souls into the afterlife. I smile and breathe a breath I haven't breathed in two years. And the other one's on my phone. I'm killing the chipmunks in my yard and don't try to stop me. They are not cute, not cute at all, eating my sunflower seedlings, my blooming cucumbers encumbering my life with holes the size of baseballs in my newly sodded yard. At first, I had a heart, I have a heart, trapped and drove the little bastard eight miles out of town, only to have a hawk swoop down. Poison peanuts, a water bucket with floating seeds, jiff baited rat traps, my husband Hunter in full camo lying in wait with a howitzer. I wonder if the hawk hires out. Thank you.
Thank you, Debbie. And now, Georgella Lyon. Her father read poetry aloud when she was growing up, and while she enjoys all kinds of writing, poetry will always be central to her. George Ella's fourth collection, Many Storied House, will be out from the University Press of Kentucky in the fall. Please help me welcome our beloved George Ella Lyon. Thanks to everybody who's here tonight and who's read, and uh, to Hap and Katerina for setting this in motion, everybody who's worked on it. I think it's just been... And this is only the 20th. We got 10 more, 10 more poems apiece. So uh, I just, I think it's fabulous. I'm really enjoying it. So this is called More. God arrived in a gypsy wagon. She came up the subway steps. She was so tired after work that we ate cheese and radishes for supper, laughing into twilight pollen on our shoulders. God came to my desk. She asked if I knew how to get out of the way. While I was rooting around for an answer, she drank my coffee. I like it cold, she said. When I entered the house of my dying friend, my ribs bound in fear, God was already there, sitting on the edge of the bed. She scooted over. I kissed my friend, who asked, what do you know about the limbic brain? She was writing about this when cancer's tide rolled in. This time, it was carrying her out. God put her arms around us, her wings. God gave me her hand, and it was more than I could hold. Thank you. I just want to say thank you for everybody for writing and for being so brave and awesome and for sharing and for inspiring each other and for being here to share with the uh, listeners and viewers of Lexington. I guess I'd like to say also that, you know, this, this is the first of many Lexington Poetry Months, so think about what we can do next June. I'd love to hear any ideas. we we. We came up with this one night at Al's Bar after a holler uh, just a couple of months ago, and so we didn't have a whole lot of time to think about it. And, you know, maybe you don't want to overthink things. But on the other hand, there, with this many fertile, beautiful minds out there, I'm sure there are some good ideas we can execute in the coming years. So help be a part of this and, and bring your ideas to us, please. Thank you. See you soon. <laughs>